Yes. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today. Uh, elevators, escalators, and moving walkways. This webinar design construction and the inspection process. As usual, we can't re reiterate enough. We really want to hear from you. Um, please take your time, scan the QR code. I'll take a few minutes and copy this link here so that you guys can have it in the chat box. Um, but we just really want to hear from you. Your feedback is always valuable. We share it with our presenters um, on how to make these trainings better. If you want to praise our presenters for the excellent job they always do, uh, please go ahead and do so. We share it with them. And or anything else you just want to hear uh, us here at the Port Authority, we can prepare a special webinar, special topics. Um, if there's something specific you want to uh, hear, but also remember that our previous webinars are on YouTube, on our YouTube playlist. I'll make sure to post that link in the chat box so that everybody has it. It's a great material for you to just revisit. And if you're looking for a specific topic or discipline, please go there. Um, it's a great resource. Our presentations are also posted on our TCAP website. And I'll also put that link to our TCAP website where you find all the information and our previous presentations as well. Too. So everything you see here is going to be shared over email, but we also post them on our TCAP website. Great agenda, like I mentioned, design review, talking about vertical transportation review process, the submission of documents, what is the review like, common errors and issues, the inspection process. Um, we have our quality assurance division, design standard unit and construction standard unit. We have also a perspective from the construction phase, what we look for with our resident engineer's office. Um, and then we have open Q&A session. Again, you don't have to wait until the very end. You can feel free to type them in the chat box, or if you want to wait till the very end to open your mic, please go ahead and do so. Uh, and then without further ado, I'll pass this over to our uh, QAD ZSU to take it over from here and hand out Amrathal Prathal. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Amrathal Patel, work with the Port Authority QAD Design Division. Uh, today we're going to talk about the vertical transportation design uh, review process. Uh, vertical transportation review team is part of quality assurance division design standard unit. Uh, design standard unit headed by Mario Palmieri and reviewers are myself, Amritlal Patel, Niles Mistri, he is a design reviewer as well as inspections and Thomas Jose, he is a design reviewer and also inspector. Next slide, please. Uh, contract drawing are uh, reviewed to verify that the construction will meet the code requirement to ensure that life safety system are met while the traveling public are using it to reach their destination. Uh, incidents involving elevator and escalator kill about uh, 30 and seriously injure about 17,000 people each year in United States. All TAAs involving or in the vicinity of movable walkways, uh, that is called move, people movers, escalators and elevators are reviewed by QAD design review team. Vertical transportation document shall be submitted to QAD with the TAA application for design review. Full set of construction drawings to delineate the type of vertical transportation that is being processed along with specification. Next place, slide please. Submission of documents. Submission of specification and drawing with all required detail leads to an early approval of the TAA. Correct drawings and specification lead to faster construction without major punch list during the inspection. This is how all municipalities operate to avoid major delay and an expense of rework. Wish you all the best. Don't hesitate to contact us for more information. 
uh, this review is performed for uh, meeting the requirement of applicable codes ASME A17.1 and Chapter 30 of Building Code. A detailed drawing of VT items are required. A statement like details will be in the shop drawings after VT contractor established is not acceptable. Uh, let us share the document QAD VT review requirements and let's talk about few items. You can, so here is the document uh, about uh, VT review and this document uh, will be shared to all the attendees in, in a, after the meeting. So all volunteer systems, uh, elevator, escalator and moving box submits, submittals must include the following. We require a full set of drawing and specification reflecting applicable code that captures machine room, control room, a machinery space, and all associated equipment. The use of unique products such as equipment not covered by ASME A17.1 should be delineated as well. Elevator submittal shall include drawings that details the elevator machine room, shaft, and pit along with all the equipment installed within that. Signage and fixture should be detailed on the landing drawings and the elevator cab drawing should detail the operating panel. Elevator and moving box shall include drawing that outline the overall system. In addition, pit, trusses, uh, and all equipment installed within should be detailed. Uh, signage, ads, video display, and the like within the vicinity of the moving walk should be delineated on drawing to show the distance is relative to this system. This detailed list will be shared along among with the group and the end of the at the end of the webinar by TCAP Central. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, review of complete set of drawing and specification is performed. Based on the review, a recommendation for approval, conditional approval, or disapproval for construction is issued. As per the code, we look for small detail to be uh, on the drawings and or in the specification. We have prepared a list of such comments. Uh, let us look at this comment. A quickly comments quickly for an example. Let's set the document of, okay, here is the document of our typical uh, comments we came across. Uh, typical, some of the most common items that we encountered during our review are essential, uh, what is outlined in the review requirements that uh, I previously shared with you. In addition to that, this document outlines in greater detail the commonly cited comments. Since this document will be shared with everyone after the presentation, I won't go in detail. However, I will touch upon few high level items. Uh, wall material and dimension of elevator shaft should be clearly indicated on the drawing along with the means by which outside air is circulated to the ventilate the shaft. In addition, the drawings should delineate a safe means of access to governor access door. The elevator pit drawing need to have the code required lighting, GFCI and simplex receptacle for the sump pumps. The drawing also need to indicate the location of pit ladder as well as the counter 
weight guard with required refuge space, both vertical and horizontal clearances and run by for the buffers of cab and counterweight. Elevator machine room drawings need to show the means to control the humidity and temperature along with ventilation ducted to outside. Fire extinguisher need to be identified on the convenient location near the access door. From an electrical standpoint, we need to see GFCA receptacle lighting and information on all the disconnect. The door to the room should be labeled appropriately and, and that should be self-closing and self-locking. The elevator cab drawing should indicate operating panel and show emergency stop switches that have red operating handle. In addition, the drawing should outline in detail the car emergency communication system. The rated speed of the elevator cab should be delineated as well as the ventilation detail, lighting and duplex receptacle required at the, on the top of the cab. The hallway entrance should indicate the location of elevator call button, signage that delineate the unit identification number for the elevators, and at all landings. In addition, in case of fire use stair, signage should be in place in uh, the event of emergency. In addition to what has already been mentioned, a system to monitor and prevent automatic operation of the elevator with faulty door contact circuit shall be specified. Seismic safety requirement should be looked at as applicable and finally ensure that the elevator system conform to the necessary test and inspect emergency brake or elevator motion controller. The typical escalator and moving walkway concerns that are commonly cited related to handrail speed monitoring, access, plate, access plates, skirts, obstruction devices uh, that are not clearly indicated on the plan. Feet and trusses are required to be enclosed with a fire rated construction. Drawings should include code data plate that is permanent and legible. The brake torque data tag should also be permanent and legible indicating the maximum and minimum values. Similar to uh, previous list, this list will be shared along with the amongst the group and the end of this webinar by at the end of the webinar by TCAP Central. Uh, this is there is a section 8.6 in the code for maintenance, repairs, replacement, and testing of elevator that shall be followed. That is all about design review. Uh, and now my colleague Mr. Thomas will talk about inspection process. Thank you, Armelo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomas Jose. Uh, the QED vertical transportation group witnesses the acceptance inspections and tests for all vertical transportation units uh, in, the, in the Port Authority jurisdiction. Vertical transportation units, which include elevators, escalators, moving walks, dumb waiters, vertical platform lifts, wheelchair lifts, and as well as material lifts. Next slide, please. Uh, so, the inspection process tests are performed by the elevator installation or the elevator maintenance company and witnessed by QAD. The tests and inspections are performed and inspected to the applicable codes. Our goal is to make sure the, the vertical transportation unit is safe for the ride in public, safe for maintenance personnel to perform all maintenance tasks, uh, safe for our inspection staff for inspections, as well as compliant with the applicable codes. Here are some of the applicable codes in New Jersey. You have the New Jersey Administrative Code, 
uh, the New Jersey Building Code, which I believe they're on the 2021 iteration of the International Building Code. Uh, New York City, you have the New York City Administrative Code, the RCNY, which is the Rules of the City of New York, uh, the New York City Building Code, which is the they're on the 2022 iteration, I believe, as well as the uh, New York City Building Code Appendix K, which is New York City's modification to uh, ASME 17.1 and the ASME B20.1 codes. Uh, some elevator specific codes um, are the ASME A17.1, which is the safety code for elevators, escalators, moving walks. Uh, ASME A18.1, which is the safety standard for platform lifts, wheelchair lifts, and stairway lifts. And the ASME B20.1, which is the code for material lifts, very large material lifts, really, and uh, vertical conveyors. Some of the applicable NFPA codes are the NFPA 70 electric, National Electric Code, NFPA 72 National Firearm Code, and NFPA 13, the Installation of Sprinkler Systems. As a result of the final acceptance test and inspection, uh, our group will generate inspection comments and provide the inspection comments to our REO staff. As for the frequency inspections, Acceptance inspections occur, to pri occur prior to placing or receiving a temporary permit uh, or a permit to occupy and prior to placing that unit in service. We also perform annual inspections, uh, category one, category five, on all vertical transportation units in the Port Authority jurisdiction for the life of that unit. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, here are some common issues that we find during our final acceptance uh, inspection. Lack of pretesting all devices for an acceptance test. The elevator escalator contractor should pretest the unit before uh, final acceptance. During the, the pretest, they should be able to find most uh, of the issues with the safety devices, electrical components, et cetera. So we're not wasting our time for the elevator contractor to fix these issues during the final acceptance. The uh, elevator recall from smoke detectors, shunt trip operation, uh, water flow uh, alarm recall, as well as escalator removing walk shutdown from smoke detectors should be pre-tested. Um, the elevator emergency power operation should also be pre-tested. So pre-testing is, is a key item. Providing an operable emergency two-way communications system inside the elevator cab. The code requires this communication system to be in place so that in an event of emergency, for example, when the elevator is uh, stuck and a passenger cannot safely exit the elevator, this communication device should be operable so that the passenger can contact the necessary emergency personnel and alert them of their situation. Uh, this same emergency communication device should dial to a location that is staffed 24 seven where the necessary personnel can take action for the situation. Uh, if the communication device is configured to call a location that is staffed temporarily, uh, the call should redirect to a location that is staffed 24 seven. If the first location does, does not answer the emergency call. Uh, the emergency, communi emergency communication system must be able to display the location and elevator number to the emergency personnel answering the call without the person trapped in the elevator stating location and elevator number. For example, the emergency personnel should know that the emergency call is from JFK Airport Terminal 5 or uh, Elevator 151 or uh, another example, 3 World Trade Center Elevator PEA1. They should be able to pinpoint they should be able to pinpoint the location of that elevator. Um, in addition to that, the, the newer uh, New York City building code also requires video uh, capability where you can see inside the elevator cab, as well as a text communication portion where uh, someone who is uh, hearing impaired can see uh, text on the screen of the emergency personnel who is answering the call. Uh, incorrect or lack of the required etching on glass or plastic used for elevators, escalators, and moving walks. Each glass or plastic panel used for elevator hoistway, elevator car doors, elevator cab interior, escalator or moving walk balustrade panels, deck barricades, um, escalator ceiling intersection guards, 
must have the required ANC Z97-1 or 16 CFR-1201 code and the manufacturer's information etched permanently and it must be legible on each piece of glass or plastic and it's got to be visible after the installation. Any sort of European code standard or any other code standard that's not ANSI Z97-1 or 16 CO4 1201 is not acceptable. Um, also, if you have a piece of glass and afterwards you put some sort of laminate on that glass, whether it be some sort of frosted laminate or on an elevator or hoistway, sometimes you might see them put a advertisement on the glass portion and it covers up the ANSI marking, that is not acceptable as well. The ANSI marking must be visible after the installation. Areas in the machine room, control room, or shaft that are adequately fire stopped or, or fireproofed. Uh, we recommend that our quality assurance division uh, construction standards group inspects each elevator shaft, machine room, and control room for fire stopping, proofing, and structural requirements. Uh, any setbacks, ledges, and projections in the hoistway that are four inches or larger in four inches larger, and in New York City, uh, two inches larger. The elevator hoistways are supposed to be constructed such that the inner hoistway, hoistway walls are flush. However, at times there might be building construction or floor slabs uh, that protrude into the shaft and creates a setback or recess or a ledge. These le ledges, setbacks, recesses throughout the hoistway from the top and bottom, from the top to bottom, the hoistway must be beveled at an angle not less than 75 degrees with the horizontal and beveled with materials that are acceptable to the ASME A171 code. Inadequate headroom and elevator machine rooms, control rooms, machine spaces, overhead machine spaces, overhead governor spaces. The code requires at minimum 84 inches of clear headroom and elevator machine rooms and control rooms. Uh, elevator overhead spaces located in the shaft with governors require at minimum 54 inches of clear headroom. If the machine room or control room has a beam, conduit, some sort of suspended HVAC system, there must be at minimum 84 inches clear headroom to walk under the beam, conduit, ductwork, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, spaces that require full bodily entry into an elevator shaft uh, to access governors and other signaling devices require at minimum 54 inches of clear headroom. <clears throat> it's, it's very key that these items are designed properly and when constructed are caught early enough because once you have a space with low clearance, low headroom, it is very, very difficult to rectify and fix these areas um, afterwards. Uh, next common is issue, unfinished surroundings for the elevator escalator and moving walkway entrances. These areas should be installed and completed, finished. Machine room and control room layout drawings do, do not match the design drawings and or it's as built. Uh, drawings. Quite often we find the installation may have equipment like machines, <clears throat> hydraulic tanks, controllers, disconnects, uh, transformers, uh, as well as other equipment in locations that are not correctly shown on the drawings. Uh, Non-elevator or escalator moving walk related equipment, conduits, pipes, wiring located in elevator machine rooms or control rooms or in escalator moving walk trusses. Uh, basically, equipment, pipes, conduits, and wiring that are directly connected with the elevator are allowed in the machine room or hoistway. Only escalator or moving walk related wiring are allowed in the moving walk. Nothing else should pass through these spaces. No um, pass through conduits, ductwork. You know, if it's not serving these uh, directly connected to the elevator or serving the escalator, it cannot pass through these spaces. It cannot enter these spaces. Uh, next slide, please. Inadequate lighting in elevator pits, control rooms, machine rooms, and elevator entrances. The code requires minimum light levels in each of these mentioned areas, and we find that the installation in most cases do not meet the code required lighting. Uh, providing a code data plate in plain sight and accurately, sorry, securely attached to the controller or mainline disconnect that indicates the code in effect the time of installation. It should in, uh, indicate the code in effect at the time of alteration if it applies. Um, this is very important as it gives information on what code is applicable to the elevator 
and if any elevator alterations are uh, applicable. It also it's also important for when we perform our annual inspections, as the accurate data plate will inform the inspector of what alterations are uh, are can be applied and what tests and inspections are to be performed. In general, the accurate code data plate must be available to understand what requirements are applicable for the acceptance tests and annual inspections. Code data plates and data plates in general must be made of durable material, an example metal. The information on these plates must be either stamped, etched, cast, and they must remain permanent. Often we see data plates that are made of paper or it might be a vinyl sticker. Uh, sometimes it's a it's metal, but it's the information on there is written in pen or uh, marker, and that information is easily wiped off. The data plate is crucial for inspections as to know what code is applicable uh, and any other information on that data plate. Provided ABC rated, inspected, and tagged fire extinguisher in the elevator machine room, control rooms, it must be a ABC rated extinguisher as required by the ASME code. Other types of extinguishers should not be located in the machine room. Uh, extinguishers such as, you know, Purple K, you know, anything else that's not ABC cannot be in the room. It has to be an ABC rated fire extinguisher. Um, signage that states the location of the mainline disconnect adjacent to the fireman's phase one uh, recall switch. This requirement, this requirement for machine room is for machine room less elevators located in New York City. The sign is required for near the fireman's phase one key switch so that Firemen and emergency personnel know where to find the mainline disconnect. Often, this sign is overlooked and not provided. Storing of copies of as-built wiring schematics for the vertical transportation unit in the machine room uh, or control room. Often, schematics are provided but not but are not as-built. Some additional features installed with the elevator system are not shown on the controller wiring schematics. Um, sometimes you'll see that it's modified, but it's hand drawn. It should be a final set of schematics that includes everything that's wiring related with that elevator. Um, you know, any sort of additional contacts, switches, features, whatever it might be that's applicable to the elevator that's being built, that should be on a wiring diagram. And that wiring diagram should be located in the elevator control room, uh, elevator machine room, uh, escalator uh, pit, moving walk pit. Um, next common issue is adequately enclosing the escalator and moving walk trusses and pits. The entire sides and undersides of the escalator and moving walkway truss and pit must be enclosed with materials that the code, the building code defines as non combustible or limited combustible. A lot of times we find the escalator pits are open to the spaces adjacent. Uh, it might be a ceiling adjacent to it, or sometimes it's even a room below the escalator, uh, which is very hazardous if there's any openings um, in that uh, in the escalator or moving walk truss. Signs or advertisements that are not allowed in or near the safety zone of the escalators and moving walkways. The code prohibits signs and ad advertisements in the safety zone, and caution should be used when placing it near escalators and moving walkways as it can be a distraction to the riding public. Elevator car and hoistway doors with glass that are not flush with its metal surrounding frame. The ASME 17.1 code requires a car and hoistway doors that have glass. Uh, it must be substantially flush with the surrounding metal, metal frame. Uh, often we find that it's not flush and the edges are sharp. So anything that's um, one eighth inch or more in um, depth between the glass and the metal frame has to be beveled. Uh, sometimes we find that it might be one eighth of an inch or less in one portion of the glass, but as you go down, it starts to increase. There might be some deformity in the glass or metal frame, whatever it might be, but as it goes more than one eighth of an inch, it has to be that entire side must be beveled. Uh, a list more common issues will be attached uh, with this presentation. Next slide, please. So, what are the key things that the uh, tenant coordinators, the REs, the tenants, the AORs, the EORs can do to ensure the success of the project? Um, all design comments must be resolved prior to the final acceptance test and inspection. Any any question raised by DUCU, all of that questions, comments should be resolved. 
all existing deficiencies uh, must be corrected. And this really applies to elevator alterations and existing uh, elevators, moving walkways, escalators. If the elevator machine room, for example, if the elevator machine room has areas that require fire stopping or fireproofing, any any other existing code deficiency, these deficiencies must be corrected. Um, we recommend walkthroughs. Cyclical walkthroughs are recommended for larger projects. Walkthroughs can be scheduled as needed for smaller projects. During during these walkthroughs, we may be able to discover issues with the installation that do not meet code. For example, uh, we might walk into an elevator machine room and notice that there is non-elevator related uh, equipment in the machine, pass-through conduits, ductwork that is not related to the elevator and it's just passing through the room. Uh, so, you know, we might walk through help find a lot of these issues ahead of time. Again, a key item, pre-test the unit, verify with the tenant, the, the elevator contractor, that the unit was pre-tested before a QAD final acceptance uh, is requested. And request follow-up inspections when most uh, deficiencies are resolved to avoid multiple site visits for just one or two items. We prefer to come out just for uh, follow-up inspections for inspection comments when most if not all the deficiencies are completed. It makes better use of our time. Next slide, please. So here are some some examples of a escalator safety zone, as well as um, signs and advertisements near the escalator. The left image is a code depiction of what the safety zone should be. And what it's saying is the safety zone of the escalator at the top and the bottom of the escalator or moving walkway, this applies for moving walkways as well. And the width of this area is defined as the center line of the left handrail to the center line, the uh, of the right handrail plus eight inches. And the length of that safety zone is twice the width. So in this area, you cannot have anything, not a sign, not a garbage can, not a stanchion, not a roll up sign, no, no objects. Um, this area should be free and clear of anything. You don't want any sort of hindrance to passenger flow in and out of a escalator moving walkway. And if you look to the image to the right, it's a good example of a installation of an escalator they have um, escalator safety signage to the right of the unit. It's away from the safety zone. Uh, they have what I believe it's two garbage cans and on either side of the escalator, it's away from the safety zone. Um, they have yellow caution signage on those deck barricades that are A-frame deck barricades on the left and the right. Uh, and those are acceptable signage. It's, it's escalator safety caution signage. Um, any sort of advertisements, uh, dynamic or static advertisements in the safety zone is not allowed. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide contains a good and bad installation example of machine rooms and overhead spaces. So the image to the to the um, left is a good example of a elevator machine room it has ample headroom clearance, ample lighting. Um, clear uh, you know, maintenance spaces um, but the image you're in the middle is a image of a overhead space which is which is very um, tight you're supposed to have at minimum 54 inches uh, headroom as you're going across those beams or you're walking across walking in that area and realistically there may be three feet 36 inches maybe 40 inches in some spots um, I'm sure it's a lot less between the beam and the underside of that light there. Uh, but in order to access the machinery up there, and you can see behind there, the, there's the orange axles with two shivs on each side. And in order for maintenance personnel to climb and get over there, it's 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 very difficult. So these air spaces must require, at minimum, <clears throat> the code required 54 inches of clear headroom. The last image on the right is a image of a <clears throat> control room. And, you know, while it looks like it has very good lighting, um, one of the issues here is there are not enough headroom underneath that air conditioning unit you see with the caution striping and caution signage. Um, rooms such as this require that 84 inches of clear headroom and putting caution striping or a uh, uh, warning signage like that is just it's not acceptable. You have to have that clear headroom. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, here's a good example of a um, glass that has the ANSI Z97-1 marking. And the image here is on the left is a, uh, a some artwork inside of an elevator cab with a glass front. And as you zoom in and the images on the right, uh, you can see that the corner of that piece of glass has the ANSI marking. It's permanently marked. You can wipe clean it and it won't come off. It's permanent, it's legible, it's visible after the installation of that cab glass. So each, as I mentioned before, each piece of glass that's used in the cab, hoistway, enclosure, escalator, or, or moving walk uh, glass has to have the ANSI mark in, the marking as, as shown here. Next slide, please. So this is, um, some examples of the beveling, as I mentioned earlier, um, the image to the left, uh, if, I don't have a before and after image, but if you can picture a, uh, a beam uh, between these two pieces of sheetrock, it created a small pocket, uh, which was more than four inches in depth here. Um, and that setback is not allowed. And, and the way that it was remedied was a piece of sheet metal was placed um, just to create a vertical facade. And, you know, you no longer have a setback. It's flush now. Uh, the image to the right of that is another uh, setback that was created by building construction, whatever it might be. And they beveled it with pieces of sheet metal and beveled it with at an angle of 75 degrees. It's fastened to the top, fastened to the bottom. It's secured. You know, now it's code compliant. And the two images to the right, um, these glass hoistways, which had the ANSI marking, but it created a very large uh, setback due to the mullions and uh, the, the construction of that glass. Um, and they remedied that by putting this wire mesh uh, fencing, if you will, to create a vertical facade. And now it's no longer, uh, no longer a, a, a ledge or a setback. You can't stand on it. That's uh, durable. So these these are some examples that meet um, the code for uh, beveling of ledges. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, some examples of ideal installations of uh, code data plates. So um, here's a here's a good example. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't apply to all elevator installations, but this particular installation is a um, is an existing elevator and they modified it with uh, multiple things, new controller, new machine, whatever it might be. And they include the installation code, uh, the original install code, because not everything was brought up to code, whatever they modified was. So all the existing stuff was tested to the, in this case, the 1985 edition of code. And whatever they altered is tested to the 2013 and everything that is altered uh, is in the box below. All the sections of the alteration is listed in that box below. And this gives the inspector information to know what tests and inspections must be performed in addition to uh, the tests and inspections that are performed under the 85 code. So, the, so it gives us a lot of information for our inspections and testing. Next slide, please. So, uh, this is an example of the flushness of glass between the metal frame and the glass panel. It's it's hard to take a picture of this, but you know, as I mentioned before, anything more than one eighth of an inch uh, has to be beveled. And in this image, um, this example of the of the glass between the metal frame was very substantially flush. You had glass, a um, silicone or rubber gasket and then the metal frame, it was near seamless. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, with that, I will hand it over to our resident engineer office for the next portion of this presentation. Thank you, um, Thomas and Amra Lowe, um, for really deep diving into the design and inspections of the vertical transportation. Um, let me start off by saying my name is Carmela Sinicolo. I'm a resident engineer here at LaGuardia Airport. Um, what 
if you've joined these webinars before, you'll notice that we have standardized our presentation slides. It identifies the roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders in line with the TCAP manual. And we do update these slides to incorporate the new element of work and as it becomes part of the REO's roles and responsibilities. So it's just sort of by saying that we are the primary point of contact from pre-construction to closeout, coordination between the tenant team and the PA facilities for all construction activities as required. And the goal is to lead the tenant team to successful project closeout. We are responsible to audit and monitor the tenant's contractor and the engineer of records activities to ensure that the work being performed is in conformance with the latest approved drawings. Um, and of course, any documentation, specs, and applicable codes, permits that are applicable for the TAA. We want to ensure that there's adherence to the TCAP procedures, whether you know it's quality control, quality assurance, uh, safety, special inspections, uh, contractors testing, uh, field changes and, uh, you know, presenting these to the various stakeholders so that we could move forward should we find any issues in the field. We do attend and coordinate um, with our Port Authority units to include PA facility security to witness ongoing construction and active testing performed by the contractor as required. REO confirms, field verifies work being requested by the engineer of record to complete um, that, that the work is complete and conforms uh, to the approved drawings prior to scheduling a PA inspection. So we coordinate, we schedule PA inspections once we confirm that the area being requested for certification and inspection is in conformance. We review the package, we make sure the title is correct, we make sure that the engineer record that is found on the five thir form, PA form 531 matches the person that's signing the certification package, and of course, all the supporting documents to include all special inspection reports, test reports are included and in conformance. The REO issues inspection minutes, noting any inspection comments and verifies that all comments are resolved. We process all required documentation to request um, permits, our internal Port Authority building department. If you're looking for occupancy, we prepare that certification package that's in conformance with the necessary documents that are needed so that we could move forward for that uh, issuance of the temporary or final certificate of authorization, which does not get issued from the resident engineer's office, but from the facility, the tenant coordinator. Next slide, please. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan with the Port Authority Resident Engineer's Office. I'm going to talk a little bit about the design or phase one of the TCAP process. Starting with the tenant and the AUR, it's their responsibility to conduct a site visit prior to submitting any design documents. The purpose of the site visit is to identify existing conditions within the site or surrounding, which can include above, below, um, or adjacent to the site to identify any obstructions that could become an issue during construction. So this could include identifying any existing utilities, any presence of hazardous material that would have to be abated prior to beginning construction identifying tie-in locations or any exposure to the elements which should be incorporated into the design. The REO reviews contract drawings primarily for constructability and to get an understanding of the scope of work. We want to make sure uh, that we understand if there's any phasing plans or logistic plans that would show uh, the various work zones to identify whether it's landside, sterile, secured areas of the airport that the work is being conducted in. We want to understand for uh, horizontal and vertical transportation, what the scope of the work is. If there's elevators, escalators, dumb waiters, whether they're new versus existing equipment that's being modified. We want to understand the respective uh, control rooms and any associated infrastructure that's required to install that new equipment, such as electrical communication, um, any fire protection or fire alarm, required smoke hatches, the layout of the equipment, and the overall construction of the site to include any walls or ceilings. And if there's any required fire ratings of those walls or ceilings, we want to understand the details of the elevator shaft, pit, and any other required equipment. We want to make sure that the drawings include the elevator or equipment make, model, the type, and any testing and acceptance requirements. We want to make sure that 
uh, any governor's or maintenance access doors that are required or included in the design. And we want to ensure that all the drawings are coordinated between the various disciplines. So ensuring that the fire alarm sequence of operations would capture all the required actions, uh, making sure that any conduits that do not serve the vertical transportation equipment do not run through those associated control rooms, any overhead utilities um, that may not be shown on a 2D plan do not become an overhead obstruction and making sure that you're providing the required clearance or any large wall mounted equipment should be properly supported and uh, coordinated with those architectural drawings to make sure that the appropriate lateral supports or bracing are installed as required. Because oftentimes we'll see that wall mounted equipment is um, fastened directly to the wall with, um, you know, directly to the drywall with anchor bolts, which may not be acceptable. So that should all be coordinated. And of course, we wanna see that all required special inspections are listed on the drawings. The resident engineer's office will monitor all design comments, making sure that they're resolved and implemented into the field. Um, I can't stress enough that any design related issues should be resolved during the design phase and it shouldn't become an inspection comment. So if the drawings call for a certain type of buffer to be installed in the elevator pit, we want to make sure that that's the type of buffer that's installed and it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't become an inspection comment um, come the uh, inspections. We also recommend that the design professional identify in the design drawings the approved phasing plan if there's any phased occupancy that's um, requested by the tenant. And again, the goal during the design phase is to reach a full design approval or an NFC prior to the pre-construction meeting. Next slide, please. All right, going on to construction or phase two. Prior to starting construction, we have to conduct a pre-construction meeting. On the left, you'll see a list of all the required pre-construction submittals, which includes the contractor's insurance certificates, MWB participation plan, health and safety plan, which should include the health and safety plan checklist. The checklist outlines all the requirements for accepting a HASP. It's very critical that the contractor review it and fill it out properly prior to submitting the health and safety plan. Oftentimes we'll see that uh, certain elements of the HASP were omitted, which is only gonna lead to a rejected submittal. And this leads to delays in having a full pre-con uh, approval, which will lead to delays in mobilizing um, and starting construction. And if I could just add on the contractor's insurance certificate, we also look for expiration dates, making sure that they're, uh, they don't uh, work uh, with uh, expired certificates. We uh, look for whether the work is being performed on aeronautical side or street side because the values in the certificate of insurance would vary greatly. Um, there often at times uh, we see the contractor um, advise us that, listen, we're getting all our deliveries and all our workers are coming in on street side, but our, uh, then we find out that deliveries are coming in on the aeronautical side that will uh, impact that certificate of insurance. So, you know, these are questions that need to be asked um, during this time, uh, ensuring that if all the work is, you know, and deliveries are being performed on street side, that's one thing. But if we see that some, sometimes this, uh, this whole route may change or deviate, then that insurance certificate also has to be modified. Please continue. Right. Thank you. And we also look for uh, name and 24 hour emergency contact of the prime contractor, the hours of work any logistics plan that are required um, to outline any construction staging areas, haul routes, delivery routes, security plan is required, list of all subcontractors with applicable trades licenses, a detailed construction schedule, which um, should be detailed. So includes start and end dates, uh, any required special inspections, AEOR inspections, any anticipated pre-tests or official tests with Port Authority, uh, any go live dates, milestones, it should be as detailed as possible. And I just want to emphasize on the construction schedule, it is it is necessary that we understand what the tenant's um, milestone date is, their go live date. And of course, what are the tasks that lead up to that date? So if the inspection for occupancy is given on the day before, obviously we cannot accept the schedule because we're not putting in the necessary time for us to do a five-day review of the certification package. 
There's not enough time for us to go in the field to verify that the work is in fact complete. Um, and if we do move forward in scheduling that inspection for occupancy, should there be any deficiencies noted, you're not giving yourself enough time for us to go through these steps in order for us to process the necessary paperwork with our Port Authority Building Department to get that certificate of occupancy to go live. So, you know, we'll be diving into these uh, as they're getting uploaded into the eBuilder and working with you and your team to make sure that we capture all the necessary steps uh, to ensure that everyone is happy at, at the end of the day, knowing that we're gonna achieve that goal for go live. Right, so we'll review that schedule and make sure it's realistic and everybody's expectations are aligned. We also require that uh, the tenants submit the special inspections checklist and environmental plan uh, as applicable and any additional documents that REO may see fit as required to complete the project. Right. And adding on to the special inspections checklist. So at this time, that checklist is submitted without signature and without PE seal. We're requesting that the entity performing that special inspection is listed. And if we do not have one at that specific time, we will accept to be determined TBD. Um, it is up to the engineer of record to take that special inspections checklist modify it to incorporate all the special inspections that are required on the TAA. So that is the template moving forward for each of the special, uh, each inspection uh, request, and it's cumulative. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So once all the pre-construction documents are received and approved by the REO, we will schedule a pre-construction meeting. At the pre-con, um, and also, at a minimum, we need to have at least conditional approval, although full approval is the goal um, for the design documents. Once this is achieved and we schedule a pre-construction meeting, um, REO will coordinate with all the various stakeholders and we will discuss at the pre-con all open design comments and a path to full design approval. We will go over any uh, critical pre-con documents, which include the general contractor's detailed schedule, their phasing of work, uh, we'll go over the scope of work. Uh, it's critical that we have the special inspections checklist because at the pre-con, we'll go over all of the required special inspections and the AER strategy to ensure that they're performed as required. We'll go over any operational requirements or permits that are required to complete the work for hot works, confined space, uh, fire hydrant use. We will review the AER and contractor's responsibilities. If there's a change of AER, what that process would look like and um, we'll go over the RE coordination process um, to schedule any required inspections or tests. And of course, REO needs ample notice to determine who will need to be on site to witness any inspections or tests. Um, special inspections. It's very critical that special inspections are performed by qualified individuals. This means that the individual is qualified for that scope of inspection and also the company or the agency is, is qualified. Um, to perform the work or inspection. So if I could emphasize that um, it's very important that the design professional that's working on the project is also um, separated. Um, there's no conflict of interest and they are registered with the special inspection agency. Um, we will be checking with the building information system to ensure that all that are performing special inspections and the agencies are registered um, using the building information system. So I just want to highlight that. Um, there's also a responsibility of how that special inspection report gets populated with information. At times we, we have to decline it or deny these inspection reports because they do not reference a code section. They're missing critical information or it becomes a photo exercise of work that we do not understand. So those reports really have to be clear, concise, referencing important um, documentation, referring to shop drawings or details on drawings or a submittal so that we all are on the same page moving forward that all the inspections that are required are captured. We're also requesting that, you know, the tenant and their engineer record get a list of all the uh, special inspectors to make sure that their, um, you know, their credentials match what they're coming out in the field to inspect and that there's a buy-in, and that's also shared with the REO so that we're familiar with the people uh, performing these special inspections. 
Right, and we ask that as the special inspections are performed, any inspection or test reports are provided to the REO as soon as they become available so that we can begin the review process. At the pre-construction meeting, we ask that the AEOR is responsible for reviewing the scope of work and doing a page turn to discuss any critical elements of construction, review their inspection strategy to make sure that all inspections are scheduled accordingly, uh, and we'll review any phased occupancy. I want to reemphasize that the architect or engineer of record is responsible for 100% of the work and inspections. Port Authority REO is only here to audit and monitor the work for conformance with the TCAP procedures. And the inspection process meeting is a separate meeting that's recommended for more complex projects where we can bring together all the appropriate PA units to go over the expectations of each inspection for horizontal and vertical transportation scopes of work at the contractor's request. We can also schedule uh, unofficial walkthroughs with our QED vertical transportation unit to provide preliminary feedback on the field installed work. Next slide, please. Moving on to construction progress. The AEUR is expected to ensure that all elements of work are complete prior to requesting an official inspection. The resident engineer's office role is to monitor and audit all field work, including attending any special inspections and tests. The contractor will provide advance notice. REO will verify that all materials used on site match the PA approved contract drawings. We will ensure that all work is complete and installed per the latest PA approved drawings and free of any deficiencies prior to scheduling a request for official Port Authority, Port Authority inspection. Next slide, please. Typical horizontal and vertical transportation deficiencies. So first and foremost, all work is to be installed per the latest PA approved contract documents, TCRM, and be code compliant. We're going to go over just some of the findings that REO uh, comes across in the field that are typical deficiencies. So REO will look at, uh, will perform inspections on moving walks, escalators, but uh, we primarily see elevators. So you know, we look at what belongs in the elevator pit, the shaft, uh, the cab, the elevator control room, outside of the shaft, which is equally as important as the inside of the shaft to be fire rated. So some of the deficiencies that we see is when the contractor installs equipment um, that is not shown on the approved drawings or deviates from the approved drawings. The EOR is to provide an approved submittal, which should identify the make, model, size, type, and installation details. Oftentimes we see that the elevator shaft is missing smoke detection or is missing a smoke hatch or an access door as required. Um, sometimes uh, if the drawings call out for a receptacle, um, either in the pit or in the shaft and it's not installed per the drawings, again, that's a deviation from the drawing, in which case the drawings would have to be updated or the receptacle or the light fixture would have to be installed in the field. Missing permanent signs or labels making sure that all labels and signs have the proper um, dimensions for the lettering in terms of height and in color. I want to make sure that labels for all disconnects in the elevator control room uh, with its purpose, whether that's for the main line or the cab light disconnect. We want to see signage for all disconnects in the control room to identify the location of the supply side to the overcurrent protection device. We should see signage at the key switch polyurethane buffers, which are not compliant with 2014 New York City Building Code, in which case spring buffers are to be used. And I believe Thomas had mentioned this sooner, you know, earlier on in his presentation. So this is no different than what Thomas pointed out, uh, that, you know, we're, we're the first line of defense before we bring our QAD inspectors out. And these are just the small items that we continuously find as we notice deficiencies. Um, and so we're just highlighting them. But uh, Thomas has a wonderful outline um, that everyone should be working off of to make sure that these, these, uh, these items that we find are minimized. Thank you. Uh, in the elevator shaft or the control rooms, we oftentimes see um, ratings that are incomplete, meaning that uh, you did not properly fire stop all penetrations within the ceilings and the walls or missing fireproofing. So if there's any conduits or fixtures that installed and you disturb fireproofing, that's got to be patched. 
in the elevator pit, oftentimes we'll see that uh, the contractor did not install a GFCI receptacle. Ladders. Um, missing, uh, missing pit ladders, or you don't have the proper required clearance all the way around to the nearest permanent object. Also, light levels is a big one. Oftentimes we see deficient light levels, um, depending on the location, uh, the different light levels are required. So at the elevator entrance versus inside the pit. Um, and the control room requires a minimum of 19 foot candles. And the light levels are to be taken with the control room door closed and pre-tests should be performed to ensure that all light levels are met. And we cannot emphasize the importance of when these inspections are happening, these pre-inspections are happening, the REO is uh, glad to join. If we're giving notice, uh, we just want to make sure that uh, we have eyes on it too on how the, the light levels are being measured. There are many times that we see them holding the meters at their waist level versus on the floor or at the you know, specific locations. Um, I know everybody wants things to pass, but again, bringing everyone out to a failed inspection um, is not what we're hoping to achieve. The goal is successful testing and, and uh, you know, successful um, occupancy and beneficial use of equipment as required. Next slide, please. Continuing with the typical deficiencies, a GFCI receptacle is not installed at all locations called out in the drawings, missing the ABC fire extinguisher, uh, installation of non-rated electrical in lieu of NEMA rated electrical equipment, keys, access door keys to be grouped to security, and the elevator machine room should not be keyed the same as other non-elevator rooms. Uh, clearance around the pit ladder should be 4.5 inches. Emergency two-way communication system is not installed. Um, the schematics should be, um, a set of the latest as-built schematics should be placed in the machine room, control room, or escalator, or moving lock pit. Uh, if there's signage or advertisement placed within the safety zone of the escalator of the moving walks, they are not permitted. Uh, special inspection reports are to be submitted to the REO, and pre-testing is required, in which case REO will participate. Um, you can move on to the next slide. Going to go over field conditions and scope changes. Field conditions should be captured during the design phase uh, via the AEOR site visit. Should anything come up during construction, the AEOR must immediately notify the REO of any field conditions, and the resident engineer will determine the best path to capture those conditions, whether that's through an official scope change or updated in the as built drawings. Typically, for fire or life safety or code related issues, an official scope change will have to be submitted. Um, but for minor field conditions, the revisions can be reflected on the as built again with the resident engineer's concurrence. Next slide, please. Moving on to AEOR certification requests for inspections, which is phase three of the TCAP process. Official Port Authority inspections are scheduled by the REO through receipt of AEOR signed and sealed certification request packages. The AUR certification requests must be reviewed and approved by the REO prior to scheduling an inspection. REO will not schedule inspections on any scopes of work with open design comments or any installations deviating from the latest approved drawings. Uh, we require that at an official Port Authority inspection, an AUR representative who is knowledgeable of the scope of work be present during the inspection and also any required contractor personnel um, which may be required to demonstrate any inspections or tests and any subcontractors. So um, whether that be the elevator subcontractor to demonstrate the system and operate the cab. At the conclusion of each inspection, REO will review all inspection comments and issue official inspection minutes. Next slide, please. All right. The AEUR certification request consists of the following documents, the AEUR cover letter to request an inspection, and whether that's a partial or a final, uh, you would either need a PH212 or a 314. And you can see an example of a PH212 for a partial inspection on the right, 
I just want to go over and highlight some key items uh, that we typically see that are missed when filling out this form. So we bubbled in red. You can see where it says check one. You got to make sure one of the options are checked off, whether you're requesting a partial inspection for occupancy or not for occupancy, whether you're requesting an inspection by area or by exclusion of an area. And you want to make sure that the location of completed work, you check one box, whether that's New York City, New York, or New Jersey, you can't pick two. So that if you're in New York City, it would just be NYC and not NYC and New York. So LaGuardia Airport is New York City. Stewart Airport is New York State. Newark Airport is, of course, New Jersey. So when you're doing any work here at LaGuardia, it's New York City. So that should be an automatic check box. Um, when it comes to elevators, escalators, and moving walks, uh, we recommend that uh, PH212 not for occupancy for all routine inspections, whether they're inside shaft, uh, pit, overall elevator uh, inspections. Um, and of course, the goal is to get the occupancy checkbox to match with, you know, in accordance to your your phase construction on your approved drawings. So just be cognizant of that, please. Thank you. And we also ask that a sketch, if it's applicable. So this is typically for a partial inspection and if it's required. If you can't identify it on the approved phasing plans, then you could provide a sketch to indicate the scope of the certification. And we ask that each sketch would include a unique sketch number. It should include the TA number and title, it should be dated with a legend identifying the area being certified and include an AUR professional seal and signature. So for example, if, we're, if you're submitting a, a certification for partial inspection, not for occupancy on a specific elevator, the approved drawings would have the, the appropriate name of that elevator. So we would see something to the effect in the middle of the documents as description of completed work. It would say all work within shaft of elevator and however you describe it on the approved drawings. That is all. We would not need a sketch because it's self-explanatory. It matches uh, the language on the drawings. Thanks. So we also look for the special inspections checklist to be populated with all the required special inspections. We'll go over an example in a little bit. Special inspection and test reports to include any applicable NFPA forms and record drawings which are required for a final certification. And as built should be reviewed with the REO prior to submitting any record drawings. We can go on to the next slide. So this is just um, what an AUR certification request package would look like. All the way in the back, you have the AUR's cover letter to request an inspection. You would have either a PH 314 for a final or 212 for a partial. You have the special inspections checklist, which would be populated with the latest dates that each special inspection was performed. And you also have a sketch all the way to the right, highlighting the scope or the area being certified with the date, the TAA number and title, a legend, and a unique sketch title and a professional seal and signature. And if I could just draw your attention to the special inspections checklist. So when it comes to the elevator escalator, you could see on uh, line 26 here, it's New York City Building Code Chapter 30, Appendix K, like it was mentioned during the design presentation. We will see a date populated with the responsible special inspection agency. Uh, you will also see, uh, if this is a partial inspection, which is line number 24, you'll see a date populated as well. And that is the engineer of records partial inspection. Also below that, you will have the name and entity and license of the engineer of record. So I want to just focus in on the dates, as I mentioned before. So this special inspections checklist starts from the pre-con where the engineer of record identified all the special inspection uh, um, categories that are necessary in testing for this TAA. It is modified to tailor and capture it all. And as the work is taking place and the inspections are being requested, this form gets populated, it's cumulative. So the most recent date overrides the prior date if applicable. And we wanna just make sure that the 
dates that are in these specific categories are happening on or before the partial inspection date signed by the engineer record. So if I see a cold form steel construction dated 4-4, and maybe this form was used at a prior inspection when the partial inspection was 4-4, and now we have an elevator escalator inspection uh, uh, report that's dated 7-3, Obviously, I could not accept that special inspections checklist because the dates are not in alignment. So the partial inspection should be date should be either the last special inspection test or category or after. And the same thing of that document being signed should match either the partial inspection date. It could be the same date of 7-3 or after. So I shouldn't see any dates prior to the last inspection held on that special inspections checklist. So I shouldn't see a date once again before 7-3. So it could be on date 7-3, but not before 7-3. That is one of the most common deficiencies found when we're reviewing a certification package, as well as the title. Move on to the next slide. So an AUR certification request can either be for a partial or a final inspection. Just want to uh, clarify that a final inspection is used when all work for the entire TAA is complete, whereas partial inspections can be used along the way when work within a specific area is complete. And a sketch may be used to outline the scope of work being certified. A partial inspection can be for occupancy or not for occupancy. Um, so a partial inspection not for occupancy would be used when an inspection is required um, prior to closing or losing access to an area. So this could be an in-wall inspection or an above ceiling prior to hardening those ceilings with drywall, for example. A partial inspection for occupancy is used when beneficial use, uh, when beneficial use is requested, again, per the approved design phasing plans. But this could be, for example, when uh, you're looking to occupy one space of an area uh, that's part of a TAA but the entire TA is not complete. And required documents at the PA inspection, we require that the AUR is present to lead the inspection and they must have available the latest PA approved contract documents, any ins special inspection and test reports or any applicable submittals, shop drawings, catalog cuts. If any questions arise during the inspection, this helps to reduce the number of inspection comments generated. We also recommend um, having on hand any RFIs that deviate from the approved drawings, um, submittals or shop drawings that could help assist in, in demonstrating the installation work should any questions also arise. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna close with some key takeaways and tips for success. Just recapping all of the major points. We wanna strive for full design approval as early as possible. And this helps to avoid any field issues or inspection comments generated due to design deficiencies. And this uh, prevents delays in scheduling official Port Authority inspections. We recommend that the EOR performs an on-site walkthrough as the design is under review to make sure that no glaring work scope is missed. We wanna make sure, and we wanna make sure that the EOR is on-site as frequently as possible as required to make sure they uh, make sure that all the work is performed in accordance with the approved drawings and all the special inspections are performed as required. Communication is key to success, keeping the REO informed of all field issues and scope changes, keeping the REO in the loop, uh, providing advance notice for any upcoming pre-inspections or pre-tests, as well as any milestones. Um, and this can be done through the general contractor's two-week look ahead uh, to provide advance notice. Uh, we, uh, we recommend that the AEOR provide draft certification requests for REO review. And if any inspection comments are generated, we recommend that they're addressed in a timely manner. So a maximum two week time frame to abate all open items. And with that, we'll pass it back on to Ryan to continue the presentation. Thank you very much, Dan. And with this, we've arrived at the conclusion of this 